Hey everyone, thanks for joining me in this class. This is the concept art I'm going to be using. I found it to be really appealing because it has a lot of things going on, like metal and skin and fabric. Plus it has a lot of props and a lot of interesting things to work on. It'd be good to showcase. So first, I start by blocking in the body. Here I'm showing you all the versions I've gone through. Started by a rough dynamesh, and then I did a lot of retopology on it. I'm going to be covering a lot of that. Usually in production, you start from a pre existing base mesh. Here in the eyebrows, you can see the, the kind of topology I uh, prefer. I find it easier to create blend shapes with. I'm here comparing it to uh, a previous version of the, the sculpt that I've modified. You see in the section here I'm pointing to the star, I've moved it closer under the nostril, away from the nasal labial fold, which is also known as the sneer line. When I move the polygon star away from that area, it really helps creating smoother blend shapes later on, especially when it comes to masking with the transpose line. So now we start by adding some poly paint to help it feel a little bit more natural. I will be alternating between a gray shaded glossy material and this uh, kind of uh, SSS skin shader with poly paint on just to, to be able to see the forms a little bit better and then also to, to have a more natural look. This is the same reason I'm drawing on uh, eyebrows. This helps with the characterization and the likeness while I'm sculpting. Especially the eyebrows and the eyeliner. I'll continue to refine some of the forms. I'm using masking around the eye here to be able to add uh, more mass on top and under. Right now I'm making sure the iris size and color matches the concept a little bit better. Next up I start blocking in the strap for the hat. I'm using a sphere here on the dynamesh it. And then I extract a one-sided strip, then I zero mesh it down. Zero mesh works really well with one-sided polygons. That way I was able to generate that strip really quickly. Now I start blocking in the hair. All this will be replaced later with X-Gen guides and curves. But it really helps with getting the likeness if I start blocking the hair. Because it really changes the look of the character, whether you have it or not. Also will help me later creating the guy curves for X-Gen. Having the topology there to snap curves to really helps. Now I'm establishing some flow for the hair. That of course will be changing later, but at least it helps with the initial look. Now I'm taking the hat into Maya to use the quad draw on it. I dropped the opacity of the blue color of the Topology down so I can see the mesh better. Making sure to trace the form of the hat. So I'm establishing that, that sharp line there, building topology for it. Now I'm subdividing the mesh and then snapping it back to the high res, adjusting the center line and the mirroring. I bring it back and project the high res to it, and then start adding some of the details. Now I'm running that strip into the hat, beveling it, bringing it back into ZBrush, then adjusting and detailing. Same thing for the neck chokers, built in Maya, brought to ZBrush. I like to do the same thing with fingernails as well. It helps starting it in Maya because you end up with a really great topology. Now I'm detailing the breasts and also adding poly paint. Although it will be hidden later, it really helps making sure the body looks correct by having everything in place. Now I'm adjusting her pose. Usually you would do an A pose, but the legs would be straight down. 
but since the concept has her with a more open stance, I've decided to make that my neutral. Now I'm bringing back the concept art and putting it behind ZBrush and using the see-through option to essentially trace the concept a little bit better and match it faster. Same thing with the hat. This really helps a lot with likeness. Now I'm switching back to gray shaded mode to see the forms a little bit better while I detail. Adjusting chin strap, adding a glossy material to the eye to give it that life. Now since the feet are exposed in this character, I like to spend some time on it. I'm trying to make sure the anatomy is correct. Now back in Maya, I create the topology for the feet. I'm using this plugin to add a blanket of quads to that area automatically. Then I extrude the toes with good topology. I bring it to ZBrush to smooth it out, which is much faster than doing it in Maya. I'm constantly sending meshes between ZBrush and Maya via OBJs using this plugin. I highly recommend it for a really fast workflow. Especially when you assign shortcut to the export and import, you can fly between ZBrush and Maya really fast. Now I'm adjusting the topology to make sure it blends in with the rest of the body and adding sockets for the toenails. Now I'll bring in a plane from Maya to make sure the character in ZBrush lines up with the actual floor in Maya, which is going to be eventually where we render things. It's really important early on so you don't move your character after the fact. Now I'm generating a base mesh for her jewelry using the masking, extract, and zero mesh process. Bringing into Maya again to have more control. I'm creating the gemstone in the middle. See I'm smoothing a lot with the smooth brush. And then jumping back to Maya again to adjust a few things back and forth. Same process here for creating the necklace base mesh. You'll see me run a polish before a zero mesh that helps zero mesh a lot if the edges are cleaner. I'm using the zero mesher guide curves to establish a flow for the topology. Back in Maya, I start cutting the holes for the necklace. I use the multi cut to create diagonal holes. Then I use a soft select to move things around. Then a mirror, bevel, bring back to ZBrush, assign a shader. I worked on the sword with polygon modeling and then dynamesh. Did require some root topology, so I bring that to Maya. Now it's always tempting to stay in Quadra, but I recommend using some traditional poly tools like Extrude, like you saw I did there, to bridge a bunch of loops. Same thing in the middle here. I inset the middle section, then I circularize it. I'm using a custom script called round, but I believe it's a native feature now in Maya called circularize. Now I'm snapping it back to the high res. You'll see I'm still using some traditional poly tools, not just the quadra all the time. This happens here as well when I extrude all that stuff in. While doing read topology, if you encounter stray vertices, you can use the average vertex tool to snap it back into place. Now I'll do some topology adjustment on the sword. Making sure everything runs vertical and is evenly spaced. And I make sure all my corners have true corners and it's not just the high res that's pushing it to be sharp. Make sure on the low res it is sharp already. Now for the choker, I'm making holes. Bringing it back to ZBrush, running a polish on it to make it round. Some anatomy adjustments on the knees. Same thing with the arms. Extruding the necklace beads out of already existing topology from the necklace. This is really easy to do in Maya compared to ZBrush. Same thing with the bracelet. New shape adjustment and extrusion. I do that with the rings as well. 
They started all in ZBrush as a mask, then a ZBrushed it to get the base. Then I'll work on detailing the hands a little bit more. Keeping it simple for this fairly stylized character. Flipping back to the gray shaded to make some adjustments on the roof cage. I'm going over Marlis Designer here, even though I ended up not using it for most of the cloth meshes. Considering how simulation works, it kind of creates chaotic result. Although natural, doesn't end up matching the concept exactly. So here I'm playing around with the, the patterns and doing a quick simulation. I'm discovering how hard it is to actually match the concept. And I prefer to match it as much as I can, so I end up just creating it in Maya using the traditional poly tools while essentially tracing the concept. I do this with edge extrusion to match every fold. This gives a more accurate result and it matches the concept better. On a lot of characters you ask to create a very generic clothes that would be ideal for Marvelous Designer to do. If you're making a generic shirt or pants or anything that doesn't have to match exactly, then Marvelous is going to be perfect, but it's just here that I found that poly modeling was more ideal for matching a concept like this one, where I challenged myself to make it as accurate as possible. I ended up keeping the Marvelous Designer sim though for the top she's wearing. I'm edge modeling to extrude the loop around her waist and bridging between them, soft selecting, moving things around in Maya. Sometimes can be faster. Now I take it back to ZBrush and use the mask borders feature and run a polish on it to get a smoother border. Now I use the same process for the cloth from her hat. Using edge modeling, trying to match the concept as much as I can. Bring it back to ZBrush to have a better fit. Adding more topology when needed. Extreme care needs to be taken when sculpting cloth and especially when making topology for it because we need clean UVs for the fabric to run in the correct direction later on in texturing. I'm adding some cloth folds trying to make it look like a simulation. Right off here is that I didn't do simulation and I matched the concept better but now I have to add that naturalism back into it. Now I go ahead and extrude thickness and add support edge loops for the cloth. This will help with sub D later when you smooth the model. We'll keep that sharpness. I'm using the earrings here for the metal loops of the belt to save time. And I'm doing edge extrusion here to more accurately model that sash. I also use the same technique here to make the knot. Take some finesse here to kind of design something like that in the back that was not visible in the concept. Now I'm trying to run that knot through the loop. One of the more challenging things is modeling a knot. I do this here with edge extrusion, but I could have also drawn a NURBS curve and then generate a polygon strip off of it using the Maya bonus tools. But I find that sometimes just modeling it directly with the edges also works. I'm adding more resolution here for sculpting later. Moving to add more resolution as well, bringing it back to ZBrush. Now fitting that stuff around with the move tool is much easier than it is to do in Maya. Adding some extrusion to it. Now I'm reusing the other strip to save time, also modifying it so it doesn't look the same. More fitting with the move tool. Some cloth folds. 
Yeah, I'm noticing on the concept that the cloth that's attached to the hat kind of floats there. But there's no way for it to be connected to the hat, like it would slide off. So I'm adding a little stitch that would kind of bind it to the hat so it would look more functional. Same thing I do here with the top strap, so it doesn't look like it's floating. Straight on one side at poly, and then I'm masking the corners and running a polish on it and zero meshing it down to be low res. Support loops. So smooth nicely. I'll go around adding some tension folds here and there. Some more tension folds on the skirt. I'm adding to the poly paint the tan lines that were visible in the concept. This is going to be used as a base for my texturing later in Substance Painter and Mari, which we'll be covering next week. Some proportional adjustment I'm noticing, making the arms a little bit longer. I'm adding more details to the lips using some references. Getting some of the wrinkles in there makes it look a little bit more natural, even though it's a fairly stylized character. Switching back to gray shaded mode to make sure my forms are working. Always good to periodically refresh your eyes by changing the material. This is also another thing that wasn't present in the concept. Adding some side stitches here. Now we need to do some topology edits. The base mesh at some point was very low res, but I've subdivided it and it's already far along. So what I do to solve this issue of slowness that happens in the viewport is that I bring the mesh to Maya and then I export it as a GPU cache and then I bring it back in as a GPU cache and then I use it as the live surface to snap my topology to. That makes it run much, much faster. I also delete one side of the mesh to make it easier to edit. During sculpting, things tend to shift around, so that's what I'm doing here is I'm adjusting it. I'm also moving the star that happens around the nasal labial fold a little bit further away, even further than before. This makes it easy to sculpt lens shapes in production. The polygon star can interfere with sculpting facial expressions. Now I'm smoothing things out to make it more even. It's good to make sure there's no tightly squeezed in loops to avoid unwanted creases. Now here I'm doing a before and after comparing how far that star has moved. Moved a few polygons away from the nasal labial fold. I'm using the Z plugin FBX exporter to export all the lowest meshes. I bring in Tamaya to start the UV process as well as final modeling tweaks. Now I'm making the internal IGO that has the iris and the pupil. I use the move on normal mode to scale everything down uniformly. It's kind of like a negative inflate in ZBrush. Now make sure I have enough support loops for the iris. Make a quick color preview. Now see the outer mesh here that's transparent that has the bump will be used as a refraction mesh later and it will bridge the gap that you see here inside view. Now I'm testing the eye rotation. Here I'm making sure the center polygons are all quadded. I'm using the plugin I was using earlier. I'm also able to spin the topology around using this plugin so I don't have to do that manual work. I bring in the mesh back to ZBrush and I run a polish on it. Export and back in Maya I update the same mesh that has a transparent shader using the Sticks plugin. It does this through importing the mesh as a blend shape and deleting the history on it so you can preserve your shaders. Now I'm moving the eyes and giving it more resolution in the center by scaling the middle vertex with soft select. Now for this model, I'm using the UDIM workflow, the UDIM, which is multiple tiles instead of 0 to 1. The UDIM UVs is usually a standard in VFX. Here I'm adjusting in the transform tab the move amount to 1 so it can move all the UVs together. This is especially fast with the arrow keys. All the UDIMs can be controlled with one shader, although you can split it to be multiple shaders later on. This also allows us to have much higher resolution per single mesh, which I'm using on the body mesh. On the body mesh, I split it into multiple UV shells spread across 10 U-DIMs. 
This allows for very high resolution, which will be really helpful for the skin pore styling later on. Now I'm going around defining seams. I'm using the 3D Cotton Sew tool, which can be found under the UV dropdown. This allows you to set the seams in the viewport much faster than you would by just selecting it. By double clicking, you define the seams, and if it encounters another seam in the way, it will stop where the other seam is. See me doing here on the arm, double clicking that, and it stops at the wrist and the shoulder. We're going to have to split the legs into multiple sections in order to fit it on the U-dims. That way I will maintain the same resolution all around the body. Good clean topology is really important for UVing. As you see here, I'm able to use the already nice and clean edge flow to double click loops and define UV seams really quick. Same thing on the hands, I'm able to separate the top and the bottom UV shells really quickly because I made sure the entire hand is cut by one edge loop all around across the fingers as well. I'm separating the mouth bag. I've made enough room in there for the teeth and tongue to sit nicely. Now I'm making a quick pack with the Onfold 3D plugin, which I think it's enabled by default now in 2019. Now I'm scaling all the UV shells together, and then realizing that I have to cut the legs into multiple sections. see me here trying and then realizing I need to split it up further in order to maintain the same scale across all the UV shells. I'm establishing the rotation. Now I'm noticing that I could split the back of the head in its own UV shell which will make for a nicer unfold of the face. Scale it to be approximately the same size. I'm eliminating unwanted seams here and adding others. After a quick unfold, now I'm moving all the shells together again, establishing a rotation. Because even the automatic pack would not get you the exact perfect rotation. So making sure everything lines up with the way it does in 3D space. Now making the first U dim, which will have the face and neck. I'm grouping all the extra stuff like the mouth bag and the eye socket and the ears. Make sure their rotation is correct. I'm trying to fit them on the UV space. Checking at the checker. I'm realizing that the face UV shell could probably be more symmetrical, so I'm now using the symmetrize tool, which allows me to define a center edge and then symmetrize one side of the UV shell based on the other one. I'm defining the center. Symmetrizing with a brush. Continue placing the rest of the UV shells into their own UDEMs. Scaling things down a little bit here and there won't hurt. As long as it doesn't deviate too much from the rest of the UV shells. We're trying to maintain uniform resolution all across the body mesh. Rotating things around, making sure it fits. Now usually the classic workflow is to 
UV one side of the mesh and then mirror it to the other side and then also mirror the UVs. This would allow you to be able to mirror the texture later. In Mari, for example, you would paint one side and then copy the texture information from one side to the other. And when you paste it, it would align perfectly with the other side. Although I chose not to use that here since the newest Mari 4.2 has a 3D space mirror symmetry. So you don't have to worry about copying textures from one side of the mesh to the other like we used to. This kind of matches what Substance Painter already has and now you just basically paint in 3D space in Mari and Substance. And all the UV shells don't have to be perfectly symmetrical like they used to. Meaning for example the left and the right arm don't have to be perfectly mirrored and matching each other on different UDIMs. In this case, I could just move them around and place them however I want. As long as the resolution matches, everything will work perfectly in Mari and Substance Painter. Don't be afraid to sometimes soft select and move a UV shell around in order for it to fit. As long as there's no stretching happening, you could tweak it a little bit just to have it fit. Also here, I'm doing a planar projection on the soles of the feet. This helps having a non-deformed UV shell. Couldn't do that with the top of the feet, so I'm just tweaking it with soft select to have it fit. Scaling it down just a little bit in order to fit it. thought it would be overkill to give the feet their own UDIMs, so I'm just trying to fit them right here. Now I have 10 UDIMs for the body, I'm inspecting it as checker map. So that concludes the body UVs, which are 10 UDIMs total. Now I continue with UVing the props. I'm also doing this with the 3D console tool, which lets me define the seams in the viewport easier. Now I'm adding edge loops here to make sure it doesn't stretch when I smooth it. Making sure things align vertically, so later the fabric pattern flows in the right direction. I will also be straightening those UV shells in a moment here. I continue by UVing the rest of the props. A good tip for creating topology for cloth and UVing it as well is that make sure it all has kind of cube topology to it. That way it unfolds easier as a grid and you'd be able to run textures on it directionally. In this case it'll be a fabric pattern. As you see here the seams are defined like a cube. Basically UV edges surrounding its six sides. notice an area that might get stretched when you smooth it, it's always good to add additional edge loops there to stop that stretching. Now for these UV shells, they look very deformed, so I will be splitting them and then straightening them and then welding them back together again. This happens later when I jump into Rhizom UVs, which is a separate app that I use for straightening UV shells. I make sure everything has UVs first. Here I'm using the quick smooth feature in the script called AM Tools, which lets me define smoothness based on hard edges. This lets me define UV scenes really quickly on shapes like this one. Also really good for anything that's hard surface that has a very drastic change of angle. That way you could define its hard edges automatically and then you can UV it based on the hard edges. You see me using the workflow here again, automatically UVing this piece. All of those unstrained UV shells will be strained later when I export to Rhizome UV. I'm using the same thing on the rings. Never miss an opportunity to delete hidden faces like in this case.
usually you'd have a custom set of teeth that is already UV'd and you don't have to worry about doing it, but I'm just showing it in this case. The larger molars in the back are more of a cube, so I'm unfolding them th that way. And the front teeth are split down the middle and the side. Just like the front teeth, the nails are done the same way, by having only one seam on the side. I do the typical planar projection and then I UV the straps. Another planar projection for the necklace, and then I go around to the 3D console tool to define the seams. Those wonky UV shells are not ideal, so I'll go back and straighten those later. Using the automatic quick smooth hard edge method, I UV those automatically as well. Same thing on the necklace. Instant UVs based on hard edges. One thing I forgot to do was actually add a tongue, so I'm going back now and doing it, it's never too late. Quick Dynamesh Sphere and then Zero Mesher really does the job. Exporting it back to Maya TV. Time to cover Rhizome UV, which is a new UV software. It has a really nice strain feature that was common in software like UV Layout, which is kind of old. So I've been using Rhizome UV to do that. It's much faster than Maya too, as you can see, strains a lot of shells instantly. Maya takes a lot of time to process those shells. Sometimes Maya works better for some shapes, but most cases you can actually process a lot of those shells all at once with Rhizome. Here I forgot to unfold some shells, so I'm just gonna unfold them and straighten them with Ryzen really quickly. Also some UVs weren't welded, so I fixed that. Some UV shells like this one cannot be done with either software automatically, so I would have to do that manually back in Maya. After straightening, I'm making sure the ratios are correct, so I'm extending top edge. Using soft select, I'll be able to more evenly space the UVs there. Same thing on the side of the UV shell, so I can avoid the stretching that was happening there. Now for the wonky UV shell, I'm gonna use soft select to kind of massage it around. In hindsight, I could have probably used the cylindrical unwrapping on this one, but at least you get to see in cases where you can't do that. You can use the lattice, for example, to kind of move it around, trying to make it as straight as possible. Now here are straightened UV shells for the skirt. I'm able to attach them back to the main shape and have a better looking UV shell that will have the fabric pattern flow much better on it and it will come out much straighter. Using the unfold brush here, I'm able to unfold sections manually to kind of alleviate the stretching. For very long tubes or straps like this one that will result in a very long UV shell, I recommend splitting it into multiple sections so it fits nicer. Using the unfold brush here, again, I'm removing some of the stretching. For those pieces here, I tried bringing them into Ryzen, but it didn't work because I noticed that the topology wasn't completely quadded at the ends. There were four stars at each end. So I ended up using the straighten shell option in Maya instead. So I'm using the unfold brush here to remove some of the stretching on those pieces. Now there's a nice feature here in Maya that lets you define one UV shell's size based on the other one. You select the original shell, then you hit get, and then you hit set on the other ones. This lets you scale them all to be uniform. Now go around here, making sure everything is spaced out evenly. And then for the final check, I enable the checker and then I look around to make sure there's no stretching on the model and that everything is facing the correct direction. That's what the numbers are for, that's why I use this custom map. Inspecting the UVs here, you can see I have a uniquely distinct rows. First row is for the body, for the skin, and then the second is for the teeth, tongue, and eyes. 
and then I have the cloth in its own row and then all the metals are in their own row. I also leave a gap between each row so that I can identify them faster and then when I export later out of Substance or Mari, the file name will jump significantly. So based on the UDIM file name when I export, I'll be able to tell which group is which. Here I'm naming things correctly and making sure it's all listed from top to bottom in the outliner. This makes it easier to select things in the outliner based on their location in 3D space. For the sword, it's a straightforward UV process besides one time I have to export to Ryzen UV to strain one of the UV shells. In most situations, Maya can take a while to strain the UV shell, so it's actually faster to export to Ryzen and bring it back in again. I gave the sword its own UDIM, which will be enough resolution for it, and then I move it to the top of the UDIM stack. It will have its own separate row. Now I do quick rig using this new plugin that came out called IK Max, which is pretty friendly to use for modelers. It's based on the human IK that's built into Maya, but it's just a nicer and faster interface for it. It helps me make a quick skeleton for posing by placing these guides in the right spot. Then it asks me to identify the joint locations and then it creates a joint based on that selection. It lets me move it around and make sure it's in the right spot before committing it to the skeleton. I'm going around adding the arm joints, the fingers, much quicker than making a skeleton from scratch. Now it processes the skeleton and makes a quick IK rig and then it puts it in T-pose and lets me paint weights and mirror weights on the other side. This is quite handy for a quick rig that's just used for posing. I do a quick and dirty skinning just to have anything to work with. A quick eye rig. Now time to attach all the props. The IK Max plugin has a really nice interface for that. Some stuff is directly skinned to the body and some stuff is just attached quickly. I attach the sword as well to the hand. Now I create my own little pipeline here by saving a rig scene and that rig scene is referencing the model scene. I then reference my rig scene into the posing scene which I'm going to be doing lighting in eventually. This workflow used on production is really important for situations where you want to make model changes. For example, I grab the hair and I attach it to the model scene and it was reflected all the way down the pipeline. And then I see it now in my posing scene. I put in a quick light just to start seeing the pose a little bit better and it also helps a lot with the peel. The closer it is you see it to the end result, the better because you start making more informed decisions. That's why I added that light. Now I'm starting the posing. So the rig skinning is really dirty and it was just done for quick posing. I used the rig to my advantage by making major broad changes, especially on the fingers. Having the rig really helps a lot with the fingers because it's much harder to do in Transpose Master from scratch. I eventually used Transpose Master and ZBrush to fix the pose, but at least having the quick rig speeds things a lot initially. I have the concept art reference as an image plane in the background so I can pose to it. Having this dual camera workflow in Maya is really helpful for posing at first as opposed to doing it in ZBrush where you only have one camera. I tweak things in one camera while I look at the other, always enabling the lights to check things. Now I use this batch OBJ exporting script. Then I bring those multiple OBJs into ZBrush using the subtool master multi append feature. Now I have multiple subtools in ZBrush named exactly like I have them in Maya and they're all separate. I then run Transpose Master and I bring in the camera from Maya using the FBX importer set to camera only import. I make my ZBrush document the same size as their concept art and my camera in Maya. And then I start sculpting and fixing stuff and updating some of the anatomy to match the new pose. Now I'm constantly switching back between sculpting and the 
camera view that's under the draw mode. This is the camera from Maya that I brought in as an FBX. This is possible in ZBrush 2019. Doing some sculpt fixes and updating. The great thing about Subtool Master is I'm able to control multiple subtools at the same time. After I'm done, I'm also using the Transpose Master to send all the meshes back to the original tool that has all the separated subtools that have the correct naming. That means it can keep a smooth back and forth between Maya and ZBrush, even in the context of posing. Continue refining and sculpting with transparency mode enabled, but keep tweaking it till I'm happy with it and then send it back to Maya. So yeah, that covers my modeling workflow. Now join me next week for Mari and Substance Painter texturing. Thanks for watching.